Good afternoon, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. My name is Rashid Omar. I am um, a faculty member here at the Keogh School for Global Affairs and particularly in the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. I also have the honor of serving as a fellow of our host institute for this afternoon's lecture, the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion. It's also co-sponsored by the Contending Modernities Research Institution. It is, uh, or initiative rather, it is my honor and privilege uh, to introduce our guest today, Reverend Dr. Mundir Isaac. Dr. Mundir Isaac is a Palestinian Christian pastor and theologian. He currently pastors to the Evangelical Lutheran Christian Church in Bethlehem and the Lutheran Church in Beit Sahur. Dr. Munithir is also the academic dean of Bethlehem Bible College and is the director of the highly acclaimed and influential Christ at the Checkpoint conferences, which many of my colleagues in South Africa um, attend. Dr. Munithir is, a, is passionate, as you will soon hear, about issues related to Palestinian theology. He speaks locally and internationally and he has published numerous articles on issues related to the theology of the land, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian theology, holistic mission, and reconciliation. He's also the author of a number of books, including a book titled The Other Side of the Wall, and From Land to Lands, From Eden to the Renewed Earth, and an introduction to Palestinian theology in Arabic a commentary on the book of Daniel in Arabic, and more recently, he has published a book on women ordination in the church. He is also involved in many reconciliation and interfaith forums, and is also a board member of Kairos Palestine. Dr. Mundir originally studied civil engineering at Berzeit University in Palestine. He then obtained a master in biblical studies from Westminster Theological Seminary, and then a PhD from the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. Mundir is married to Rudena, an architect, and together they have two boys, Karam, 11, and Zaid, 9. His lecture today is titled, The Holy Land, Empires, and the Bible, a Palestinian Christian Perspective. I believe he'll speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we can have some uh, dialogue and exchange. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Mundir Isaac. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming, and I would like to begin by thanking the Ansari Institute for um, the kind invitation uh, and those uh, involved in organizing this, um, this event. Um, very grateful for uh, the opportunity because honestly, we don't always have uh, venues or platforms as Palestinians and definitely as Palestinian theologians. Uh, and so we appreciate uh, the opportunity and definitely I'm not taking it uh, for granted. Uh, the title of my lecture is uh, The Holy Land, uh, Empires and the Bible. Uh, and of course, I will be speaking as a Palestinian uh, Christian. Uh, I will be speaking from my own experience, uh, having lived there uh, in Palestine all my life and engaged in theology for almost all my, uh, all my career. Um, and so needless to say, I am not trying to present an objective as if overview, I'm speaking from the inside as, as a Palestinian. To begin by reflecting on the title, the Holy Land, uh, Empires and the Bible. Uh, and, and I would argue that these three things, the land, the Bible, the empire, are actually an inseparable triangle. Uh, the Bible talks about empires. Uh, in fact, the empires always controlled the biblical land. Uh, if you look at biblical history, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, uh, the Bible as a text itself uh, was produced in the context or in the shadow of uh, empire. Uh, most scholars put the Hebrew scriptures as having, you know, in its final forms uh, in the post-exilic context. So, uh, uh, you know, dealing with 
exodus with uh, dealing with uh, exile, I mean, uh, forcible displacement, being refugees, challenge, you know, being challenged how to deal with empires is the context in which the Bible was put together, at least the Old Testament. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, the New Testament uh, was written also in the context of the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, and the most important theme in the New Testament, at least in the Synoptic Gospels, the kingdom of God is by design a challenge to empires. You're talking about a different king and a different uh, kingdom. Uh, even in the Bible, the you know, Hebrew prophets spoke of an eschatological kingdom that rivals other, uh, other uh, empires. So again, uh, my point is that it's, it's impossible to, you know, th these three things, the empire, the Bible, the Holy Land, are uh, in, inseparable. Um, and, uh, you know, historically, the Holy Land, geographically and politically, has always been uh, kind of the playground of uh, empires. Uh, there is a famous um, painting or map of Palestine being as if in the center of the universe. I'm not sure if you've seen it with the three circles and Palestine, the Holy Land in the middle. It's a very romantic view of Palestine being the center of the world. But in reality, uh, Palestine has always been the playground of empires. They would fight not just over Palestine, they would fight one another uh, in, in Palestine. It's not the most nice position <laughs> Uh, honestly, uh, to be in. Now, now, having said that, as I said, um, it's important to highlight and emphasize that over history, from biblical times until today, Palestine has always been living under empires and occupations. I mean, look at just very, very broadly, the Romans. I mean, post-biblical times, uh, Byzantines, the Arabs, the Crusaders, the, the Mamluks from Egypt, the Ottomans, the British Mandate, uh, and more recently, uh, Israel, are all the same pattern, uh, occupations, powers. I mean, the people of Palestine actually never ruled themselves. You know this about the people of, uh, of Palestine. And in fact, I would argue is that uh, part of why there is so much misconceptions about the current Palestinian-Israeli reality is because most people fail to see and understand Israel as a settler colonial project rather than, you know, a normal country. I think that's, that's important to highlight uh, in the midst of this uh, talk uh, uh, as on Israel being an extension of these consequent uh, empire. Israel was founded by uh, European settler uh, colonials. Um, and in this environment, in this context, the people of the land, as I said, Palestinians have ruled themselves. The people of the land uh, known for over two millennia as Palestine, uh, the Palestinians have been not just, you know, uh, in the sense under the military occupation or so, been marginalized, uh, dehumanized, and demonized uh, by these successive powers. Uh, the people of the land have always been secondary to the interests of empires. Uh, uh, and not just the people of Palestine or the Orient, the Middle East in general, but even the Christians of Palestine and Oriental Christians have always been secondary and have always been sacrificed at the altar of uh, colonialism. I mean, you would think that Western colonial power would care to protect or support the Christian presence. Uh, history and reality tells us otherwise. Uh, we're not as important as we think uh, you know, they would care. We have always been exploited by uh, uh, the empire. The exploitation of people by empires is, is a typical facet of, of empires. Uh, and so I would argue that not just we as Palestinians have been marginalized, dehumanized, and, and demonized even, even the church itself, as I would argue, and this is an important uh, argument I would like to make, have been exploited by empires. Um, and this is where I will bring the, um, the whole issue of the third element, the Bible, because theology and religion has always been a tool of empires. Empires cannot exist without religion. They need something to give them legitimacy, and the Bible has always been used. So I will now focus and bring the focus on the recent uh, developments, the state of Israel, uh, and how empires played a role, and how theology in particular played a role uh, in this. Uh, the theological origins, as if you wish, of the modern uh, struggle. 
uh, you, you see European Christians, especially in the British times, uh, have developed increasingly uh, in the 18th century, 19th century, uh, this interest in the restoration of the Jewish people. Uh, to them, the, the problem of the so-called Jewish problem, meaning we can't mingle, you know, we can't really include Jewish Jews in our societies, uh, uh, they, they channel that into beliefs that Jews can only be saved if they, you know, in the end times, uh, their restoration became a goal. Uh, and this, in their understanding, uh, necessitates the presence of Jews in their own homeland. So the idea of bringing Jews to Palestine uh, as part of uh, or necessary step of the restoration began to gradually develop uh, among Western European Christians, as I said, especially in, in Europe, it's well documented uh, how that happened. And in, in that framework, Palestine was promoted as a country without a nation for a nation without a country. This is a slogan that was uh, first promoted among British church leaders and theologians, actually before the modern Zionist movement promoted the slogan, a land without people for a people without a land, which actually uh, tells us that, uh, uh, you know, Christian Zionism predates the modern Zionist movement in their own thinking. Uh, and of course, Palestine as a land without people as a, or as a country without a nation is not to be understood literally because they knew too well that the land has people. It wasn't as if they imagined an empty land, uh, but to them, the land was empty in terms of people of equal worth to the incoming settlers. It's a typical colonial uh, mentality. Uh, and you see, there was a different interest. And, you know, in, in my writings, we highlight how that was manifested in uh, writings and quotes by uh, Christian leaders uh, in the UK who thought something is far more important is happening with the Jews coming to Palestine. It doesn't matter what happens to the, uh, to the Palestinians. And at the same time, the ingathering of Jews in Palestine or the Zionist movement also became a strategic goal of the British uh, Empire, uh, if you wish, an extension to the empire. So uh, it's, a, it's a double added bonus. You know, one thing is the theological thing, but then there is uh, a strong political ally for us uh, in the Middle East. And this was then the creation of Israel uh, when Belfort made the infamous declaration promoting Palestine as a home for the Jewish people. Uh, there are um, numerous studies that show the Christian theological impact influence on Belfort himself behind making that, uh, that uh, uh, declaration. So then Israel was created. Uh, Israel was not created on empty land. For Israel to be created, half of the Palestinian population back then had to be expelled uh, from the land, expelled, um, creating one of the biggest refugee crises in our world even today, where we still have more than 5 million at least Palestinian uh, refugees. So the creation of Israel is, is the Palestinian Nakba. Nakba is a word for catastrophe, uh, meaning, you know, it was a, a catastrophe of biblical proportions, if you wish, losing more than 78% of our land. And when I say land, I don't just use that in a general sense. I, I talk about land we've owned and farmed for generations. Uh, uh, hundreds of towns completely destroyed and removed and uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians becoming uh, refugees. Uh, yet, all of this was celebrated in the Christian world uh, as a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, as a fulfillment of uh, prophecy. And you see, the fate of Palestinians became irrelevant, if even considered at all, uh, when, you know, uh, in, in these Western Christian attitudes about the land, in which we're celebrating the creation of Israel, we're celebrating the restoration of the Jewish uh, people, uh, and all of a sudden, even the Christians of the land uh, themselves became uh, secondary. Uh, you see, the creation of Israel was so much uh, devastating, not just for Palestinians uh, in general, uh, but even when you think of uh, uh, how Palestinian Christians are now uh, viewed. Uh, let me read to you a quote um, um, by Palestinian theologian Mitri Rahib, commenting on what happened in 1948, at least one side of it. Palestinian Christians, the native people of the land, were not visible in this Western Christian theology, uh, the Anglo-Saxon theology that supported Israel. 
Just as Israel erased Christian demography and geography from Palestine, so Western theologians erased Palestinian Christians from their theology as if they had never existed, as if they did not belong to Palestine, and as if they were aliens in the Holy Land." Uh, end quote. Uh, what he's trying to say is that the creation of Israel replaced the Palestinian Christian community with something new. And let's be honest, for most of you, most Christian audience, when you think of the term Holy Land, the first thing that comes to mind is Israel and the Jewish people, rather than uh, the 2,000 years Christian presence uh, in the land. And that was completely removed from uh, the thinking, the theology uh, of Christian churches, even from the modern reality and modern engagement of churches with uh, the, uh, the Holy Land. My point is that behind all of this is a Thirstan theological belief that completely put aside and pushed aside the interests of uh, Palestinians and Palestinian uh, Christians. Now, of course, in the 20th century, there has been uh, other developments that helped in this shift of paradigms in the way, in, in these new theological uh, paradigms. Uh, for example, uh, what is uh, known as the post-Holocaust theology, uh, many Christians uh, reflecting on uh, anti-Semitism within their own traditions, uh, resulting in a revision, revisiting of, uh, you know, years uh, of attitudes, negative attitudes and anti-Semitism towards the Jewish people, which developed in return a, a very positive approach toward Judaism and by extension Zionism and the state uh, of, of Israel. Uh, today there are strong Christian Jewish dialogue uh, groups among all denominations, I'm involved in some of them, but oftentimes, uh, in most cases, these uh, dialogue groups dictate the terms of uh, engagement. Uh, Jewish liberation theologian Mark Alex calls this the ecumenical deal, in which he says, you know, Jews and Christians sit on the table, and in exchange, you cannot say anything negative about, about Israel. Uh, and so, so in, in, as a response to something that was needed, uh, you know, anti-Semitism within our own tradition, new developments have risen, uh, and one of the consequences of new, these, these new developments, and of course they were needed and positive, but some of these consequences is uh, an, an environment in which, you know, it's almost difficult to criticize uh, Israel. Uh, even now among liberal uh, Christianity, uh, and these Christian-Jewish dialogue, it's sometimes hard to criticize Israel. Of course, there is the interest in the Jewish roots of the New Testament and the Christian faith and so on. Uh, and of course, the 20th century has also witnessed the rise of evangelical fundamentalism uh, with an increased interest in the end times uh, to the level of obsession, I would argue. Um, you know, millions of books sold, uh, you know, predictions about the end times. Uh, it was a fascination and an obsession. Uh, and of course, uh, Israel and the Jewish people uh, became an object in the eschatology of many evangelicals. Uh, and this resulted in strong financial and political support to Israel. And I can, uh, you know, dig so much deep into this. We've written so much about this phenomena of, of Christian Zionism. Uh, we've seen the emergence of uh, the Christian right, especially in the United States, as a political force. Uh, there were two peak areas, first during the Reagan presidency and more recently during the Trump presidency. And a tenant in the Christian right is support for, uh, for Israel. Maybe you don't know much about this tenant of the Christian right. Maybe the focus is usually on family abortion and, and uh, gender and sexuality. But a big tenant of the Christian right has always been uh, unconditional support uh, to, uh, to Israel. Uh, in fact, it became a Christian duty to support uh, to support Israel, which brings me to go some you know a little bit much in detail into Christian Zionism, uh, and I've always argued on you know Christian Zionism as not just a political movement but a sign of imperial theology. Christian Zionism as an imperial uh, theology, Christian support of Israel today, uh, because in that. Uh, side of Christian support to Israel, we see the employment of God. Uh, 
for political purposes, the idea that God is on our side, God on Israel's side. Uh, we're no longer talking about a chosen people, but about a chosen state, even. Uh, God protects Israel, God is on the side of Israel, and then certainly God gave the land to the Jewish people. Uh, Jews have a divine right. Uh, you have to bless Israel, uh, otherwise, you know, if you don't bless Israel, God will not bless you. And, and what's striking to me as a Palestinian looking from, you know, afar on, on these things is uh, people will go crazy if Muslims employ God in the same way. Uh, but we're perfectly fine saying that God gave the land to the Jewish people or Jews have a divine right. Uh, and of course, in that way of thinking, uh, we as Palestinians are anti-God by default, because if I challenge the premise that God gave the land or, or Jews have a divine right to the land, I'm not just saying no to Israel, I'm saying no to whom? I'm saying no uh, to God. But that's the way the empire uses God and religion. God is on our side, as such it becomes difficult to say anything in opposition uh, to that. Um, in addition, second, talking about Christian Zionism and his imperial theology, the, the uh, utilization of the us versus them mentality. Um, every empire needs an enemy. Every empire needs a devil, right? Um, first, it was the communists. Now it's Arabs and Muslims. Uh, and in that framework, you know, there is always the uh, us versus them mentality, us being the good, the superior, the uh, God is on our side, having the right theology, um, versus the back-minded, if you wish, the backward Arabs, Muslims. This is where the uh, utilization of the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, language becomes uh, a weapon. Uh, um, you know, the Judeo-Christian tradition, many for us consider it as a code for cultural superiority as opposed to the Arabs and Muslims. Um, when I talk about this, I always use a quote by um, then Vice President Mike Pence, who I just learned today spoke here in uh, one of your graduations, so it's okay. Uh, uh, Mike Pence uh, was in Jerusalem uh, speaking to the Israeli parliament or Knesset uh, when he was Vice President. Uh, and he said uh, the following. He said, we stand uh, with Israel because your, uh, uh, your struggle is our struggle, your values are our values, your goal is our goal. We stand with Israel, and this, these are his words, because we believe in good versus evil, um, uh, liberty over tyranny. Um, good versus evil, uh, liberty over tyranny. So you see who are the good people and uh, of course, how are Palestinians characterized? We are uh, the evil, the tyrant and Hebrews and right over wrong, good over evil, liberty over tyranny. We are the wrong, the evil, the tyrant. Ironically, all we're asking for as Palestinians is our liberty. But you see how the world is, is here divided as us, the good, the, the right, the freedom loving people as opposed to the others, the tyrant, the evil. Uh, to me, this is the ideology of empires and the ideology of walls at its peak, you know, at its uh, pure uh, expressions. An ideology of supremacy uh, that gives certain, ex and, and don't think for a moment this is just a way of thinking because recently Israel passed the nation state law, which uh, says, and I quote, the right for self-determination in the land of Israel is exclusive to the Jewish people only. And this is in the so-called only democracy uh, in the Middle East. So you see how uh, notions of supremacy become perfectly fine and acceptable uh, to the extent that they are part of, of laws. And of course, in the process, the other, as I argued in the beginning, is dehumanized. Uh, and the other becomes, it's their fault. As I said in the quote, the Palestinians are the evil, the wrong, the tyrant. Um, um, in, in my book, I argued that we've always, as Palestinians, been on the other side of the wall. We've always been seen as, you know, secondary. And if needed, we're terrorists. We're, we're you know, we're to be feared. Uh, we are the uh, problems. Uh, and so you separate, you segregate against those who are 
in your position uh, uh, the problem. The wall we have today in Palestine is just an expression of that. Uh, you know, Israel can put all the labels at once on that wall in terms of security and self-defense to us. It's, it's a wall that always existed and sought to disengage with, with the Palestinians and separate and isolate us. But as I said, we've always been on the other side of the wall, especially in Western Christian uh, theology. Um, and this idea of dehumanizing uh, uh, the other has also extended to us as Christians. So don't think that, you know, well, they might be saying these about the Muslims, but not against you as a Christian. Uh, we as Palestinian theologians have always been on the receiving end of lots of scrutiny and criticism, even pressure to not have us speak in public forums uh, like this. And part of it, and here's my point about imperial theology, is that they seek to control the narrative and if needed, the theology, and they seek to dictate the terms of engagement. That's one of the most important tools of empires, dictating the narrative. For example, in our case, they dictate the idea or they promote the idea, the myth, as I call it, the myth of an empty land, as if Israel was created on an empty land, or as if nothing existed in Palestine for 2,000 years. Uh, you know, the same group of people who were expelled in 70 AD, returned 2,000 years later to an empty land and restored it and made the desert into the Garden uh, of Eden. And I strongly invite you to read books um, such as the ones by uh, Noor Masalha, Palestine, 4,000 Years of History, that engage and explain the rich and diverse history of Palestine over uh, the years. But in Western academia, especially, and especially in, in theological circles, uh, you know, you get the impression that Palestine had only one, you know, only the presence of the kingdom of Israel in it, and that's it, and maybe the Byzantine, and, and, and that's it. But Palestine is much, much more uh, than this. Uh, but that history is certainly eliminated. Um, and many has pointed even how archaeology contributed in the elimination of Palestinian history, the renaming of places, of towns, of uh, you know, you enter the old city of Jerusalem into the Tower of David and only, you know, to discover later that it's actually a Muslim building. Um, and it was renamed the Tower of David. And then you just get the impression everything now is. Uh, so the elimination of history, um, the characterizations of Arabs as the problem, that's all part of the, the pilgrimage, uh, the control of narrative. And pilgrimage today is also a manifestation of that, not just archaeology. Uh, you visit the Holy Land on a typical tour for pilgrims in the Holy Land. You go to Galilee, uh, the places where Jesus walked, and I have a lot to say about this but for the sake of time. Galilee, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth, and uh, um, Jericho, Masada. And of course, you get the impression that there is nothing in the Holy Land other than the biblical sites uh, and uh, Israel and the Jewish people, and they created this wonderful state out of nothing. Because you don't go to the Palestinian towns, you don't go to Nablus, to Ramallah. Uh, at best, they spend two hours in Bethlehem. Uh, and if it wasn't for the Nativity Church, they wouldn't spend these two hours, usually waiting in line to go to the place where Jesus was born, with no interest in the people around them, with the culture, with the Palestinian side, or the suffering of uh, the Palestinians under, uh, under occupation. These walls also that they see speak volumes about uh, the narrative, you know, because usually for the, the majority of pilgrims, they are told that it's dangerous to step into the Palestinian side. They are told that, you know, be careful when you go to Bethlehem, because walls, as I said, speak, uh, speak volumes. Uh, now, in addition, uh, part of the way in controlling the narrative is uh, controlling uh, discussion on Palestine and Israel. And this happens everywhere, not just in the academy, but even in churches. Uh, you talk to anybody in the academy or in churches, um, and they tell you they feel that talking about Palestine is like stepping on uh, eggshells, right? Uh, they're always, everybody's afraid of uh, being called anti-Semitic. Uh, and uh, the Zionist lobby have utilized the uh, IHRA definition, which uh, gives examples of criticizing Israel as examples of anti-Semitism. Uh, in, 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 in an attempt to control how one speaks and, and addresses uh, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. As I said, it's part of promoting a certain 
one uh, mono narrative. Uh, pressure is used in theological circles uh, by uh, using words like supersessionism, replacement theologians, uh, and in this context, it becomes very, very difficult to speak because anything you say will be characterized as supersessionist. And, you know, as I said uh, in the discussion earlier here today, supersessionism to me is just a way of controlling the narrative and shutting down every conversation before it, uh, it starts. Um, more recently, uh, we are being challenged and uh, pressured as Palestinians on when we talk about means of resistance. Uh, talking about boycotting Israel becomes very, very challenging, even illegal in some context. Uh, more recently, uh, there is a strong discussion on characterizing Israel as an apartheid state. Um, and to me, it's a question of whether the human rights and international law matters or not. Because if you have Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, many UN reports, um, uh, Israeli human rights organizations like B'Tselem and Yejdin, and many, many others, uh, certainly South Africans, uh, use that word to describe Israel. And of course, it's an international, it's a crime by the international law. And we're not doing anything against it. Instead, we're, you know, we're being challenged when we use that word as Christian theologians or as Christian pastors, and we're being told it's not helpful, it, uh, it burns bridges. Uh, all of that is, is part of an attempt to control the, uh, the narrative. Uh, you know, and again, it makes us wonder, does the international law uh, matter? In the framework of this imperial theology, uh, justice is relativized, uh, justice is ignored, or, you know, um, you blame the victim, uh, or, you know, in some cases, you talk about the sovereignty of God, theology, or, as I said, uh, you just justify it. Even violence is justified. Um, the Gulf War is promoting democracy and freedom. Um, you know, bombing Gaza is self-defense. Everything gets a term and everything is, is defined. Uh, and, and everything is much, much more nuanced than that. But, you know, by giving these simplistic terms that give them legitimacy, you justify even in, uh, in, in justice. Um, and of course, when it comes to the matter, I ask the question of the international law and human rights. Uh, I'll just tell you what um, recently a uh, South African theologian and leader told us. You say, when, when you talk about the international law and human rights, remember that these things do not apply to superpowers. They can do what they wish. Um, and we've seen that as Palestinians more recently when sanctions were put on Russia almost immediately after annexing and invading Ukraine. And we're saying, yeah, okay, that's fine, but what about us? You know, why isn't anybody holding Israel? Uh, holding Israel accountable. Now, to wrap all of this discussion together on uh, the Bible, empires, and the Holy Land or the land, um, I would first say empires are still alive. We're not in the post-colonial era. We're, you know, we're still living the effects, maybe in, in new different ways. Uh, colonialism and uh, the times of, of empires. Believe me, empires are still alive. And second, uh, the relationship between politics and religion, empires and religion is still uh, at play uh, today. There is a strong relationship between theology and, uh, and the politics of empires. On the ground, for example, the relationship between evangelical Christians in North America and the right uh, and Israeli right is well documented. There are numerous studies about it by Israeli groups, by the way, about exchange of visits, conferences, supports, gifts, uh, speaking engagements, and so on. Um, when Netanyahu recently became prime minister again, after a, a short brief of time when he was not, uh, a month before he was prime minister, and this is very telling, this is very telling, he did his kind of... Uh, speaking tour, uh, you know, victory march speaking tour uh, in evangelical mega churches. He speaks in every single large evangelical mega church, you name it, Joel Osteen and, and others. Um, the relationship between the Israeli right and evangelical Christianity and Christian Zionism is well, well documented. Uh, so all of these is still uh, alive. And 
in, in that sense, uh, I would like to say this, even if as a footnote and give it for you to, for wider consideration, uh, it becomes maybe uh, understandable and it makes sense why most surveys done in USA indicate that white evangelicals and white Protestants in the United States tend to be more pro-Israel than American Jews. Okay. So the relationship of power, religion, the Bible, all of this, and, 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 and the land, it makes to me at least now more sense why, you know, we see this. Uh, this uh, um, Palestinians on the other side, on the other hand, uh, are, uh, as I said, dehumanized, uh, ignored. We are, as I say in my book, on the other side of the wall. In fact, we have always been on the other side of the wall because, and I hope I have, was able to show this, walls exist before they are constructed. And we've always been secondary and exploited by Western Christianity um, uh, for other purposes. Um, case in point, for example, uh, uh, Christian Zionism, which has been very terrible for us as Palestinian Christians, very harmful, not just as the theological positions, but as acts on the grounds. Uh, with their political lobbying and engagement. Uh, and you would think that Christian Zionist leader would care to hear from Palestinian Christians or from Palestinian evangelicals. That has never been uh, the case. And we've pleaded, we've argued, we tried to, uh, but that has never been the case. And this is nothing new. Uh, uh, the Crusaders time, uh, I think it will be uh, not wrong to say that we are still suffering from the consequences of what the Crusaders did in the Middle East more than uh, 800 years later, okay? Uh, and you think that the Crusaders came with an interest in reviving Christianity in the Middle East. Well, they almost eliminated uh, Christianity uh, and Oriental uh, Christians, just as the Gulf War was terrible for Oriental Christians. And oh, by the way, Middle Eastern Christian leaders and church leaders pleaded with the different American administration, especially the Bush administration, not to do the war uh, with uh, no listening ears. And now we've all seen the result of that wars on uh, Middle Eastern uh, Christians. My point again is that we're not as important as Christians as we might think. And uh, that's why when we hear of conferences by American presidents or vice presidents on protecting the Christian presence in the Middle East, there is so much politics into that. There is so much uh, Islamophobic notions and other uh, motivations uh, beyond or behind these, uh, these conferences. And we don't really always uh, buy this. Um, and I would also say that in this context, and I will end in this point, uh, there is a strong and vibrant theological reflection that is coming uh, from the other side of the wall. There is a strong and vibrant reflection on God, the Bible, that is coming from the, mar the margin. Uh, today, uh, Palestinian theologians talk about the Bible as a Palestinian text in that it was written in the context of oppression. It was written under occupation. It talks about justice. It talks about righteousness and peacemaking. We are situated in a position that helps us understand when Jesus said, blessed are those who, are, who mourn, uh, blessed are the merciful, blessed are those who are thirsty for righteousness and justice. These things are very relevant to us. Uh, and there is a strong and deep theological reflection today, if you want to call it Palestinian theology, that is coming from the other side of the wall, uh, a theology that is definitely anti-empire, uh, a theology that is challenging uh, the empire and challenging the simplistic notion, we do this because the Bible uh, tells me so. Uh, the Bible, as I said, was written in the context of empire. Uh, and uh, in, in, in that, in, in the way we read scripture, uh, we just celebrated Easter. And in that reading, we remember that God became the victim of the empire. Uh, Jesus died at the hand uh, of, the, uh, of the empire. Uh, an empire that was, by the way, aided by uh, religion. Uh, 
you know, sorry to shift into my preaching mode. Uh, one of the most striking uh, statements in, um, in the Gospels to me was when, uh, I think it was Herod talking to the religious leaders about what to do with Jesus. And he said, well, he's your king. And they said, we only have one king that is Caesar. And you see here the relationship between religion and empire at full force, you know, they use one another, they rely on one another. And in a striking way, uh, Jesus became a victim of that. He was crucified uh, on the cross. And that's why, as I said, we read the text as an anti-empire. Uh, we read the Bible as an empire, anti-empire text. We see the kingdom of God as an anti-empire movement a kingdom that I often describe in my writings as a kingdom of meekness rather than that of, of power. Uh, Palestinian theology speaks and focuses on issues of liberation and justice, uh, but more recently, uh, the focus has, been, has shifted not just on justice, but on resistance and resilience. Uh, today, there is a movement of Palestinian theology that is talking about uh, not just God's liberating and affirming presence, uh, but uh, the idea of lamenting, uh, enduring, uh, and at the same time, defiance and resilience and hope. Uh, resilience is an important concept. In Arabic, it means sumud. Uh, resilience in the face of empires, resilience in the face of religious uh, extremism, resilience in the sense of saying, this is our homeland and we're not going anywhere. And so I end with a quote from Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, who proclaimed uh, in Arabic, there is on this land what is worth uh, living. Thank you. Thank you so much for this reflection. I wonder if you can share uh, a few more words uh, about interactions you may have had uh, with um, Christian Zionists. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of that scene that I always show my students. I will be focused on the, that scene in the film, Till Kingdom Come, uh, so as an example. Uh, so if you just can say a few more words of the kind of, if, if you had more uh, deeper conversations with Christian Zionists in Palestine. Thank you. So you've watched the, yeah, the infamous scene. Uh, I don't know if you know what she's, what the question is. It's a, it's a film done by um, by an Israeli journalist, I'm not sure, uh, uh, on the impact of, of Christian Zionism on, on the Jewish community and arguing that Christian Zionism is actually, and that was one of the points actually I skipped in my talk uh, in that many argue that Christian Zionism is actually uh, filled with anti-Semitism. Um, and especially when it comes to the belief that in the end times, two thirds of the Jewish people will convert and the other third, no, sorry, two thirds will perish in a battle and the other third will convert to Christianity. So everybody's celebrating the presence of Jews in Palestine, uh, only, you know, in some of these scenarios, not all of them. Uh, this is what will happen. Um, and, and in that documentary, which highlights just Christian Zionism, uh, one of them ends up in my church talking to me. Uh, we've talked for more than three hours. They've only shown three minutes in the film. Uh, and, and you would think that he was, um, you know, um, but of course in the film it's clear, you know, he didn't change uh, a, a bit in his, and in fact, he was very, very dismissive. Uh, suspecting anything we say, um, There's no such thing as Palestinians, he would say. We're, we're, you know, we are invented some of the things we've been called. Um, uh, so uh, over the years, engagement with, you know, they've always been dismissive. They're always been um, not just dismissive, but uh, putting labels on us. Uh, this is wrong theology. And the problem with I have with all of that is, and this is what I try to argue in, in my lecture, 
is that they always assume they know better. They always assume not just they have the right reading of scripture, but they assume that they have the right understanding of the political reality. Okay. And, you know, it's one thing to disagree over theology, and I've done many debates with Christian Zionists. Uh, it makes, you know, it's not nice, but you, you do them. What really I cannot stand at all is when uh, an American pastor from Kentucky comes to Bethlehem and argues politics with me and try to explain my reality to me as if he knows my situation better than me. And, and that's, that's the kind of attitude that really takes us. And that's why, by the way, many of us decided, okay, we're not going to just do this. We're still, you know, still one of the few who's happily, you know, will accept any opportunity to speak. Um, but to be honest, we've also seen many Christian Zionists as a result of our work uh, rebrand themselves. There's a book called The New Christian Zionism. And they are trying to shy away from the end times, from the John Hagee kind of thing, from what will happen, and just to focus on Israel as a hope of the Jewish people, part of God's plan, and having a soft place for Arabs and Palestinians as long as they agree with our Christian Zionist theology. So there have been some rebranding, but I don't think it's that much different from uh, uh, Christian uh, Zionism. And I've seen people change. I've definitely seen people change. Uh, uh, especially when they come and spend time in Bethlehem. Uh, uh, I wish more people come and spend time in Bethlehem, uh, but uh, I'm not that, you know, we will continue to engage as much as we can, and yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for this. What a fascinating uh, uh, exposition. I, I, you know, a few days from now, um, on the 11th of May, we will commemorate one year since the tragic killing of Shirin Abu Akleh. Yeah. She was, as you know, a Melkite uh, Catholic. Um, so I want to take the debate not only from evangelical Christians, but to the Catholic Church, uh, because you are at the Catholic University and often you know, the silence uh, about the killing of Sharina Bakla is really confounding. Uh, often when we speak about the issue of um, Israel-Palestine at this university, we say, or we, we hear our officials say, there are two sides to the story. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm kind of confounded by uh, you know, the official Catholic position on the question of Zionism and the question of, and the silence about Sharina Barclay. You're bringing me into the... Yes. The, the journey. Yeah, she's also an American citizen. Um, um, it was a tragic, tragic death. And it's not just the silence over the death, but what happened during her funeral and how her um, cascade was attacked, uh, coming out of a Catholic hospital, by the way. Uh, and so definitely, um, Shirin Abu Akla also, you know, she gave um, a strong uh, face um, to Palestinian Christians. Um, And to me, it remains fascinating, uh, as I said in, in, in the church the, the, day, the week after. You know, in her funeral, uh, thousands of Palestinians took place in Jerusalem. And some commented, we felt that Jerusalem was liberated because they couldn't do anything. Uh, and Palestinian flags, and I, to me, what's fascinating is it was a Palestinian Christian woman whose voice her, her weapon is her words, and, and, and as a journalist, uh, that brought all Palestinians together, and we felt, definitely felt Jerusalem was free for one day. At least that's the, the, the notion. Um, but just a quick comment, and try not to get myself into deep trouble here, about the Catholic position, and for that sake, the Lutheran position. I'm a Lutheran pastor. Um, the, 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 
mainline churches, let's call them this way, have always obtained a very balanced, as they put it, diplomatic positions of, you just said it, two sides of the story, uh, two state solution, we pray for peace, and uh, we hope things get better, okay? Um, if needed, we can speak against the settlements, uh, against some Israeli policies. Um, if there is violence against Christians, everybody speaks loudly. Um, and, and honestly and definitely, I would hope that our church leaders speak more aggressively or prophetically, I would say, against what Israel is doing. Um, when you said there is two sides to the story, yes, I agree, but to me, this gives the impression that we're talking about a equal side conflict, and it's not. Um, if you follow exactly what's happening on the ground right now, we don't have a conflict. We have a reality in which one people, one nation is oppressing the other. Um, and it's no coincidence that the word apartheid is being used more and more. We have a one state apartheid. So the idea of two sides of the story and two states and praying for peace gives the impression that there are two sides, equal sides fighting over a piece of land. And that couldn't be any further from the truth. And so definitely I wish sometimes um, church leaders speak more prophetically, challenging the current status quo of oppressor, the dynamic of oppressor, uh, oppressed rather than being uh, just diplomatic. I forgot who it was, but one of my South African friends taught me a phrase that I'll never you know, always use. It talks about toothless Christians. They bite, but they don't hurt. And I think many times this is what churches do. We say things, but statements, you know, uh, and at best uh, pray for peace. Um, yeah, I hope I didn't get myself in trouble. Hello, thank you so much for coming, and it's such an honor to have you speak with us today. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first one is, what are your hopes for the next generation of Palestinian Christian theologians? Um, what I've noticed and observed is that I think Palestinian evangelicals and younger Palestinian evangelicals are at the forefront of uh, confronting Western evangelicalism. Um, for example, you have Bethlehem Bible College. Um, and then second, I wonder if you could elaborate on Western Christian colonial legacy on the fragmentation, or the inner fragmentation of Palestinian Christian communities. Uh, can, can you say more about the second question? Um, so I know you elaborated a lot on uh, Christian Zionism and kind of the effect it had on Palestinian Christians as a whole. Um, and so in this question, I was thinking specifically about a British legacy on denominations, for example, and bringing in missionaries, I mean, how that has affected Palestinian Christian history and Palestinian Christian communities and theologies there. Okay. So what is my hope for Palestinian Christian theology? That's the first question. Um, first of all, I, I hope people stay in the land. I hope people continue to engage and understand the importance of theology. Uh, I hope people don't, you know, it's very common among well-intentioned and educated Palestinians now to say that religion is part of the problem. And it's my hope that no, we see religion as part of the solution. Uh, so definitely, you know, we need to engage more. Uh, I think one of the things I've been saying, we need to also engage more with our own people. We need to write more in Arabic, um, um, not just, you know, because for a, and for a perfectly um, good and needed reason, we had to write in English. We had to engage with the Western world because the theology coming from what the West is still very harmful to us, but that shouldn't prevent us or, you know, that doesn't mean we shouldn't engage with our own uh, people. Sometimes we need to be self-critical of our own leaderships uh, without ignoring the bigger, uh, the bigger picture. Um, I'm encouraged uh, by our work at Bethlehem Bible College and many young voices coming through the Christ at the Checkpoint movement. Um, and, you know, it's, it's much, much needed. It's much needed. 
um, in terms of the legacy, um, it's there, and I don't think it's just uh, it's it's the legacy. I think one of the challenges we face today is that most of our churches have still strong ties with outside. Um, we still depend financially, uh, and a lot of our leadership is actually not Palestinians, even though the congregations themselves are 100% Palestinians. Uh, if you ask many people on the ground, they would tell you, and I know I'll get in trouble for saying this, that even our churches are occupied uh, because, you know, church hierarchy sometimes controls what is said and what is not said. Um, so there is that struggle even today. Um, and there is, uh, it's not a, a tension in the sense of uh, disengagement between Palestinians and the heads of churches or, you know, but I think there is that hidden tension, I would say, um, that exists today in many circles. Um, and you would see that in how uh, different sometimes the message of activists and theologians and pastors and clergy from that of the bishops and patriarchs. Uh, for example. Um, so there is certainly that legacy, but I think we're still not a united front fully as, as Palestinian Christians, and uh, we're not always speaking in the same tone. Uh, on the ground, we are ecumenically, the, for example, Kairos Palestine and, and other movements does bring voices from the different churches together. Um, um, the reason I love Kairos Palestine is the moment we are in the room, everybody forgets who's Catholics and who's Orthodox and who's Lutheran, and we just focus on the goal of justice and liberation for the Palestinians and how we can achieve this. So there are very strong signs and very positive signs on the ground, I would say. Yeah. Okay, we're approaching time. So before we close, I want to ask the last question if that's okay. But before that, I also want to thank uh, the students, uh, doctoral students, Daniel, Panura, and Tan, and the students who support, who support the conversation around Palestine for really um, taking the initiative to bring thank this, you. to bring you to campus. And they've also organized a reception afterwards. So thank you uh, for doing this. And we at the Institute, you know, we're committed um, to engaging uh, Christians in the Holy Land. Um, and so this visit is a fulfillment in part of that commitment. And we hope to continue this. We are, my, every time you said, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into trouble, I was thinking, well, I, I'm also going to get into trouble when you say this. Because, you know, I'm a Muslim at a Catholic university doing global engagement with religion. We bring indigenous voices here. We bring voices that, um, like yourself here, and they put challenging issues you know, on the table. And I think this, just the fact that we can have the space to have this conversation and that it's encouraged is an indication that the needle is shifting. Now with that premise, we are on sacred land right now. We're actually, this is also occupied, I don't say occupied land, but this is the land of the indigenous peoples. And they, according to them, we are tres still trespassing and they have whole deep grievances. Um, but time, you know, we're here, I'm here, you are here. And time kind of, you know, washes things away or at least makes them more and more invisible. So from your perspective, you know, now a few, at least there's been generational shifts since the Nakba. The people who are in Israel have been born there, many of them have been raised there, and they know no other home. And so when they hear a conversation like this, it's obviously challenging and deeply threatening. So how, given that reality, I, have, I'm, I don't have a, an answer to this. What is your, um, what are your thoughts on how this is all, this one state apartheid reality, is, how is this all going to yeah. end? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Um, and this is a question, of course, that 
we thought of for a long time. Um, in, in Palestinian theology, we have developed what I called and promoted in my books, the concept of a shared land. Uh, sharing the land as opposed to dividing the land. Uh, and it all begins with the premise of, and um, to summarize, you know, I, I done a PhD in the land theology, and I always tell my students, you don't need a PhD from Oxford to figure out that in the Bible, the land belongs to God, you know? It doesn't belong to any nation or people or it's God's land. Um, and then we all belong to the land. We all belong to God's land, but because it's God's land and we belong to it, we have to respect God's will for that land. This is my theological, very simple premise. Uh, respecting God's will for the land means we have to share it. Uh, uh, in my philosophical view, I think one of the reasons why we are where we are right now is uh, we built solutions on the principle of division and separation. I don't think that brings peace. If, if my idea of peace is, I don't want anything to do with you, let's build a fence and we don't talk to one another and that brings peace, that's delusional. Uh, but that's what's been happening in our land for a while. The problem with walls is that they are usually built by the powerful and they are built with the pretext of, we cannot exist together. So I, I don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe that lie. And I believe that we can share uh, the land. Sharing the land meaning means, you know, I don't have a political articulation of that. It could still be two states, maybe with open borders, I don't know. But our land is too small to divide, this I know. Sharing the land will mean having the same rights, regardless of religion and ethnicity and nationality. Sharing the land would mean uh, having the same responsibilities. There will be no second class citizens. Uh, I think the problem right now, the biggest problem right now is with the fact that, you know, we don't have the same rights. Uh, you know, my, my, my aunt, my cousins live in Lebanon. They cannot even visit us. Their home still is in, 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 in Beit Zahur, you know. Uh, but any Jewish person can immigrate as long as, and, and, make Palestine their homeland. That's the problem we have, the, the dual standards. So as long as we're there, we cannot, we cannot move forward. So we have to look beyond ending the occupation. The goal, and I say this as a, as a pastor, as a theologian, the goal is not to destroy Israel. The goal is to share the land with Muslims and Jews and Christians, to have this concept of, of a shared land. Ending the occupation can never be the goal. Sharing the land is the goal. I put it in very simple terms. I, I, my, my hope for the land is for my children to have Israeli friends one day. That will be the ultimate goal. Um, now, how do we get there? We get there by ending the occupation. We get there by having the right analysis of the situation, by calling things with their name, by challenging powers, by challenging the structures of powers that exist. This is how we get there. And we, we don't get there by soft language and so, that's the ultimate goal. We need to put it in mind. Um, revenge and destroying Israel cannot be the goal. Uh, are there voices that say this in Palestine? Certainly, but there are certainly many, many voices now in the government that don't want Palestinians in the land. So there are today many extreme views and exclusive views in our land. And uh, our response to exclusive ideologies cannot be another exclusive ideology. It has to be a inclusive one. Uh, and in that way, we will have partners, Muslims and Jews and Christians, Palestinians and Israelis. That's a platform I think many of us can agree on. We might be in the minority today, but I think that's the only way I see forward. Thank you.